deal with the, the revelation of Jesus, the hand, the resurrection, the sword, and the eyes. Uh, these, these are all revealed in Revelation chapter 2. And we're not going to be able to deal with it exhaustively as I'd love to, so you have to go home and do some reading on your own, but we're just going to kind of like do a drive-by uh, these four churches. So we don't have a whole lot of time to go and check in on all the churches, but you can go back later on and you can sit in the parking lot if you want to and digest what's going on in each one of these churches. Uh, we got the church of Ephesus, the church of Smyrna, the church of Pergamum, and the church of Thyatira. And uh, I'm not going to focus on the churches as much as I'm focusing on the revelation to the churches. And each one, you're going to see a revelation of Jesus Christ. Uh, you're going to see some good stuff about the church, and you're going to see some concerns about the church. And then you're going to see the blessing to the church if they repent. And so he uses this formula for each one of the churches, and I believe this formula applies to us. Jesus shows you who he is. He's going to tell you some things about yourself that are good. He's going to also tell you some things about yourself you need to fix. And then he's going to give you an opportunity to repent. And if you repent, here's what I have for you. It's beautiful, beautiful formula. Some of us can learn a lot from Jesus. He says, take my yoke upon you and learn of me. We like to do stuff our own way when we're dealing with people, when we're dealing with individuals. But Jesus has his own way. And I love his way. I love his way. Thank you, God. So we talk about the hand. Everybody that has a hand, why don't you just take a look at your hand. <laughs> and what's in your hand? You know, God can do a lot with this hand. And, and I don't know if you're right-handed or you're left-handed, but one of your hands is stronger than the other hand. And, and generally, most people in our culture, in our world, are, the right hand is considered the strong hand. Uh, but some of us have a strong left. <laughs> Got to watch for them left sometimes. But the, the hand actually is a symbol of power. And so when we see Jesus Christ and we see him extending his hand and he says, in my hand, I have these seven lampstands, these seven stars, excuse me, but in the midst of these seven lampstands. So these seven messengers to the seven churches are in his hand. A lot of us have gone through a lot in this life, a lot of hard times. And your hands have experienced a lot of pain. Some of you have arthritis in your hand. I can't see it, but it's in there. Some of you have scars in your hand. And some of those things we can't see. Some of you have weakness in your hands. And some of you have strength in your hands. And I don't know who you are. But what Christ wants to do is God wants to take over your hand, and he wants to be your hand. Anybody need a hand? A lot of days I find myself needing a hand, and Jesus is your hand. He is your right. He wants to be your right hand. You know, I used to hear people say, well, so-and-so is my right hand. I don't know who so-and-so is, but I know for me, I want Jesus to be my right hand. He's a strong and a mighty tower. And he wants to be your hand. So if Jesus is not in your hand today, I want you to pray, Lord Jesus, be in my hand. Thank you, Jesus. Not in my pocket, but in my hand. He says in verse 9 to the church at Smyrna, I know your tribulation. Your poverty, but you are rich. <laughs> now, the interesting thing about this whole thing is that he's like, okay, I know what you've been through. I know what's going on in your life, but you're still rich. And a lot of times you can feel like you don't have a lot in your hand. But when you got Jesus in your hand, you got a lot. 
He, he's like, if, if you got me, you got way more than you think you got. I don't know who's out here. Somebody out here today, you've been going through, you've been suffering, and things are upon you, and you're sitting here saying, boy, I ain't got a whole lot in my hand. Any of y'all who play cards, you know what it's like to be dealt a bad hand. And you want to throw your hand in. But Jesus says, I'm in your hand. And I can take a bad hand and make it good. I can work it out. He says, the slander of those who say that they are Jews and are not, but are a synagogue of Satan. It's rough to hang out with people who pretend like they for you, that they with you. But when you get a bad partner in a, in a, in a hand of cards, boy, it's a struggle. You trying to figure out, are you playing with the other team or are you with me? And sometimes we feel like in our household we've been dealt a bad hand because we don't get to pick who our children are, who our parents are, who our cousins are, who our coworkers are a lot of times. We don't get to pick those things. A lot of those things have already been picked for us. And so we go through tribulation and trial. But when Jesus is in your hand, he's like that ace of spades. He's like that deuce that's wild. He, he, he's like that, that card that can just trump every other card. And it's available to us. He knows our tribulation because he's experienced the tribulation. Some of the things that you're going through, you're thinking nobody else goes through this. But Jesus is like, I know your tribute. I know what it's like to have brothers that don't believe in you, a mother and father that don't understand you, people all around you that are attacking you. I know what it's like to go through. See, when we think about Jesus Christ, a lot of times we think about this perfect, this guy with the halo on his head. We don't think about the one who's got the nails in his hand. We don't think about the one who's stabbed in the side. We don't think about the one who's called everything but the son of God. He knows tribulation going through anything that Jesus hadn't been through. Talk about some back aches. Have you ever been hanging up anywhere? I remember a kid, we used to hang up on the monkey bars for a little while. We'd see who could stay up there the longest. And the longer you hung on that bar, the only thing you got was weaker and weaker. And you go home with some big calluses in your hands. Calluses used to be so big I could eat them. I would chew them, try to chew them off. Something about having calluses in your hand. Memories of why you were trying to hold on by yourself. And if you just had somebody holding you up. You just had somebody say, you know what, you have hands. I got you. He tells the church of Smyrna, do not fear for what you are about to suffer. He says, the devil is about to throw some of you in the prison that you may be tested for 10 days. You will have tribulation. Be faithful unto death, and I will give you a crown of life. Jesus says, don't worry about what you're getting ready to go into. I've got you. A, a lot of times, we want to say, Jesus, get me out of this thing. Some of y'all are sitting here right now, and, and you got a court date. Some of y'all are sitting here right now, and you got... A, a surgery schedule. Some of you are sitting here right now and you got to meet with somebody and you're saying, Lord, take it away. I don't want to go through that. I don't want to show up. I don't want to have to be there. He said, don't be afraid. Go through with it. I've got you. He is okay with Satan doing things to us because Satan actually helps reveal stuff about us. You know, it, it was Joseph, who said what Satan meant for evil, God meant it for good. God is not doing the evil. Satan's doing the evil, but God is using the evil that Satan is doing and working it for your good. So I'm sitting up and saying, go ahead, Satan, because everything you're doing, God is working it for my good. He's taking all of the bad stuff that you're stacking up against me and you're working it against me. My brother told me one time, he said, don't worry about the bricks that people throw at you. He said, use them to build your house. They throwing bricks at you thinking they hurting you and you saying, thank you, boo. Thank you, boo. Putting everything in place and keep throwing them. You, you giving me ammunition. I need these bricks so I can build my house. He says for 10 days, you're going to have to go through it. 10 days is not that long when you got God with you. 
One day is too long. You don't have God with you. It seems like an eternity. But it's something about knowing that God is with me. He says, be faithful unto death, and I will give you the crown of life. I love it. Don't fear. Verse 13, he says, I know where you dwell, where Satan's throne is. Can you imagine living in a place where Satan is enthroned? Can you imagine that? Hello, welcome to America. <laughs> Surprise, he's on the throne. We see it all the time. We go, oh, I can't believe another school shoot. Oh, I can't believe another murder. I can't, nah, you should believe it. This is where Satan is enthroned. This is what happens in his world. Just turn on the news and you'll know who's in charge. He says, you dwell where Satan's throne is, yet hold fast my name. We still have to lift up the name of Jesus. We still have to exalt God, even though we live in the place where Satan rules. John, uh, uh, John 17, Jesus prayed a prayer. He said, I won't take them out of the world, mm -mm, but I do pray for you. He said, I'm not going to take you out of this world. I'm going to leave you in this world, but I'm going to pray for you because God is testing you so he can see what kind of church you are. said that it, as in the days of Antipas, my faithful witness who was killed among you, where Satan dwells. A lot of times when we see somebody else die, we see somebody else fall, we think it's going to happen to us, but Jesus is saying, just be faithful. Just trust me. The things that happen to somebody else is not necessarily going to happen to you. Just be faithful. Here's the things he has against them. Verse 14. He says, there are some of you who hold the teaching of Balaam who taught Balak to put a stumbling block before Israel that they might eat food, sacrifice to idols, and practice sexual immorality. There are some people in this church that are practicing sexual immorality. He's not talking to the world He's not talking to Satan. He's talking to his church. It's interesting to me the stuff that goes on in the church. I don't know which church this is. I don't know if we're in the right house or not. Maybe a different house. But there is sexual immorality being practiced. Practice means that you do it a lot. It means you do it often. That means you're trying to get good at it. And there's some things that we shouldn't be good at. We should be good at repenting. We should be good at turning away from, saying no to, but we're not so good at that, are we? And then he also talks about eating food, sacrifice to idols. I don't know anybody in here that worship food. Jesus says, I know your works, your love and faith and service and patient endurance, and that your latter work exceeds the first. But I have this against you. And he's talking to the church of Thyatira. That you tolerate that woman, Jezebel, who calls herself a prophetess and is teaching and seducing my servants to practice sexual immorality and to eat food sacrificed to idols. As we go from church to church, you're probably saying, well, I didn't, I, didn't, I didn't get all that about the last church. But as you go from church to church, you're going to notice some commonalities. The word tolerate. There's a lot of things that we should not tolerate. And so what Jesus is coming and saying to the churches as he goes from church to church, one of them you're tolerating a certain type of teaching and another one you're, you're tolerating certain types of people. And, and Jesus is saying, you don't have to tolerate those things. I know it's hard living down here in this earth realm. But somebody told me one time, he said, you ain't got to let people say anything to you. You ain't got to let anybody do anything they want to do to you or around you. You don't have to tolerate that. I'm glad my mama is here because it was some stuff in her house she didn't tolerate. And when you live in a house 
powerful people don't live in tolerance, then you got to decide whether you want to stay there or not. And, and Jesus is sitting here saying, look, if you want my blessings, there's certain things I'm not going to tolerate. And you got to decide whether you're going to tolerate these things or not. The first thing that Jesus reveals to him, to us about himself in, in John's revelation uh, in this particular chapter is that he's got these, he's got these, uh, he's got these hands and, and he's got these hands that used to be scarred and now have the stars in them. And then the second thing he re reveals to us is that he's resurrected, that he's come back from the dead. So the third thing he reveals to us is the sword that comes out of his mouth that cuts on both sides. The fourth thing is his eyes. And so as we deal with each one of these churches, as we break these things down, here's the main thing you want to know. The first thing is his hands. Whose hand am I in? We got to be in the hand of Christ. We cannot be in the hand of Satan. If you look at your life and what's going on, you can tell whose hand you're in. And most of this world is in the hand of Satan. God says, if you're in my hand, and no one can pluck you out of my hand. But if every time we look around at you out of God's hand, you out of God's will, something is wrong. Because nobody can pluck you out. But guess what? The word didn't say you can jump out. You can jump out of God's hand and out of his will anytime you get ready. Let's get in his will. He says, I am the one who was, has died and is resurrected. I came back from the dead. If I can come back from the dead, you can come back from anything. There's some of you here that have, have lost your first love. He told the church of Ephesus to go back to your first love. Remember how you used to be. You know, there's certain places that, that I go now and I'm like, ooh, I remember. But somewhere along the way, we got snared. I want to talk to somebody who got snared. See, when I was young in the woods, I used to see little traps. There would be a little box or a little cage, and there would be a little door that's sitting up. And I used to wonder what those little things are. And then one of the old men told me one day, he said, that's a rabbit trap. I said, oh, okay. Well, why would somebody want to trap a rabbit? You know, they sweet, nice, you know. they. But they weren't trapping the rabbits to look at them. They didn't want no rabbit pets. They was looking to make rabbit stew. <laughs> and so, see, Satan, he's not playing around with us. Satan is setting traps, and we're thinking, oh, that's just, a, oh, that's just, oh. I, but you get in that trap. It says that he comes to steal, kill, and to destroy. So when he puts a little woman out there for you, mighty men of God, he's not just trying to, to give you a nice woman. He's trying to kill you. When he puts a nice man out there with the biceps and looking good and, and tattooed up. and No, he is trying to kill you. And some of you are in relationships and you're wondering, like, Lord, this can't be from God. It's not. Because you saw something and you got trapped. And so many of us have been snared by what we see with our eyes. One of the characteristics of Jesus is the flaming eyes of fire. And the feet burnished like bronze. Jesus has been through the fire and his eyes are not fooled like our eyes are easily fooled. This idea about this Jesus who's just easy going and just let you get away with any and everything it doesn't do too well when you get to Revelation. Because see, when, when we get to Revelation, we're getting closer to the end. And so Jesus tolerates and allows things. It, it seems that he's tolerating, but he's not really tolerating. He's just showing patience. When, when he caught the woman in the, dish, the issue of adultery, he didn't tolerate it. He didn't let her get by. He just pointed out to everybody else that all oh, y'all getting ready to go too. He, he let her know that you have done wrong. Go and sin no more. But he let everybody else out there who had rocks in their hands, let them know, guess what? Every last one of y'all got sin too. And your time is coming. He doesn't tolerate. He doesn't allow these things. But he's patient and long-suffering. And when it comes time, he's going to do damage. And so this is the last message to all of the churches. 
And he's saying, Ephesus, get back to your first love. If you don't get back to your first love, you're going to be removed. He talks to the church at Smyrna and says, look, you're getting ready to go through something. If you try not to go through it, you try to avoid it, you're going to be removed. He says, you got to go through if you're going to follow me. He talks to the church at Thyatira, and he says, look, you got to stop allowing Jezebel to rule your life. Stop being manipulated. You got to stand for me, and you got to set some rules in the house. Jezebel doesn't run the house. And then he tells the churches, Pergamum. Scripture. Let me tell y'all something. I used to have these scriptures memorized. And you know what? I don't have them memorized right now. But I thank God for this Bible because I can go ahead and find it. But I got to give it to you just like this. The way God gave it to me. tell you what he said every last one of them here it is right here verse 15 and verse 14 he said that you hold the doctrine of the Nicolaitans which thing I hate he says repent or else I will come upon thee quickly and will fight against them with the sword of my mouth verse 17 he that hath an ear let him hear what the spirit saith unto the churches to him that overcometh, I will give to eat the hidden manna, and I will give him a white stone. I was trying to find that because there's a, there's a connection between what we eat and what we know and what we learn. He says, beware of the leaven of the Pharisees. The bread represents the teaching. And so the church at Pergamum is the teaching. It's the stuff that you're allowing people to teach you and the people that you're following. So I want everybody in here to close your eyes. Close your eyes. 